Hey, everybody. I'm uh, here. This is AJ Ali, Profiles of Love. I'm here with uh, Jane Elliott. And uh, Jane Elliott's mission, as you, you may know, one race. She's an internationally known teacher, lecturer, diversity trainer, and recipient of the National Mental Health Association Award for Excellence in Education. You may know Jane from her Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes exercise, which she devised in response to the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968. This famous exercise labels participants as inferior or superior based solely upon the color of their eyes and exposes them to the experience of being a minority. Okay. She unapologetically exposes prejudice and bigotry for what it is, an irrational class system based upon purely arbitrary factors. And if you think this does not apply to you, she says, you are in for a rude awakening. Learn more about her work at janeelliot.com. Learn more about Jane Elliott, the person whom I affectionately call my cousin in this episode of Profiles of Love. Love, Jane, welcome. Thank you. I, I'm, I am your cousin. I'm your 30th to 50th cousin and <laughs> cousin to everybody listening in on this, if there are any left now. Yes, yes, absolutely. What, what do you say to people who say, well, no, nah, we're, we're no, nah, I'm not, I'm not related to you. I'm sure you've heard that before. Well, sure. And then I say to them, and what planet did you come from? <laughs> because if you aren't related to me, you must have come from another planet because everybody on the earth is, has ancestors. Their ancestors are in Africa for every one of us, no matter what you think your skin color is. You have ancestors. Your ancestors came from Africa. Get over it, people. I agree with you. And, and you know, you and I, we have a lot of debates, right, about justice and love and, and life and, and all of that. And and we, we have uh, fun and vigorous and respectful uh, debates. Um, but that that is one thing I 100 percent. We're, we're totally in line on that. You know, you, you go back far enough. We're all related. We're all I call it Ohana from my, you know, Hawaiian spiritual roots. Okay. Uh, one family, Ohana. Okay, that'll work for me. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to ask you four questions, and uh, they're all based on the, the love is the answer principles. Not that not that soft, squishy feeling, love. Not that one, but the, the okay. L dot O dot V dot E dot. <laughs> Love, love is an acronym for lots of various emotions. I like that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you can you can hate somebody and still say I love you. <laughs> well, you know. And you can say I, I love ice cream and I love bread and I love my grandchildren. But the, there are various emotions, and that's what love is composed of. Lots of various emotions. Yeah, yeah. That you know, when I grew up, my father uh, would beat my mother a lot. And he would terrorize us physically, my brother, but, you know, mentally and emotionally, my sisters and I. And he would come in to the house late at night, drunk, beat my mom. Fifteen minutes later, he'd come into my room and tell me that he loved me. Mm -hmm. And that really screwed up my my head when it came to, you know, that that word, that feeling. I, you know, It was hard for me for many, many years to understand what love meant. Because right. of that, you know. Well, so. my, mother, my mother used to tattle on us to my father when he came in from the field. And, and so, so he'd give us a whipping. Mm. And she said to us while he was doing it, he, he wasn't vicious. He just had to settle him down because settle us down because there were seven of us and she couldn't control any one of us. And while he was giving us a whipping, she'd say, he's doing this because he loves you. Mm. And I think, love me a little less. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't feel that that was loving at all. I understand now that it was. But if his if my mother had loved us, she'd have done it what she should have done as the mother and control the situation instead of instead of making my father the ogre. That yeah. was too bad. Yeah. So I think a lot of us and probably, in fact, most of us probably have had those kinds of experiences. And 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 so, you know, it's no surprise, right, that people don't get it right when it comes to uh, love, because we're never taught that we're hardly ever taught that in school. Well, we're hardly ever taught that at home. We're never taught that in school. And you as an educator, uh, you have made such a significant contribution to humanity. You're, you're really a, a global treasure. And I'm wondering 
in in all your years of of teaching in the educational system how many times did you run across a class on teaching people how to love themselves and how to love others oh no 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 that isn't taught in the public schools however it's going to be if we aren't very careful if we aren't very careful if we don't defeat these christian nationalists there are going to be going to be things taught about love that have nothing to do with reality mm. but have to do with forcing forcing everybody to be a christian and that is the most dangerous thing that we've got going in this country right now is the attempt to change all of us into christians there are 40 if we start teaching religion in the schools if we start teaching reading writing and religion all we'll teach is religion there are 4200 different religions on earth Mm. And which ones are you going to teach? Well, the people who want these Christian nationalists want us want to take us back to the 1500s. We must resist that at every opportunity. We must resist putting religion in the schools. The religion, but a specific religion. Christianity is a wonderful thing. I believe in much of what's in Christianity, but I do not believe that you have the right that I have the right to force my belief in Jesus Christ on anybody else. That's yeah. their problem. Their, that's their right to decide what, who they want to worship or if they want to worship at all. This is really scary to me. What's going on right now with Betsy DeVos as the Secretary of Education? You see, we have some real problems going that people aren't thinking about. Everybody everybody should get the book. Um, uh, and I've got, I'll get the book. But anyway, there's a book out there about the worshipers. Mm -hmm. uh, power of Powering the word. The, Anyway, that it's 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 an excellent book about what's going on right now, where religion in the schools is concerned. We've got to fight this with every every bit of ourselves. We've got to fight this attempt to put Christianity in as a topic, as a subject, or as the subject on religion in the schools. Yeah, it sounds like. And by the way, when you if you figure out what that exact title is, I'll I'll, I'll drop that into the uh, into the the post when we put the video online so yeah. we'll find that um we screw things up so so much you know love is such a simple thing right and we 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 want to we need to teach it but you're absolutely right it's got to be done the right way and and we, well, we everybody has a different a different feeling about love and a different mm -hmm. feeling about people and a different feeling about a spiritual being and a different feeling yeah. about what God and we have a right not to study God in the schools, the public schools in this country. And if you want to form a charter school and get money from the government for your charter school, take money from the taxpayers and put it in a charter school where you're going to teach about Jesus instead of leaving, letting you want a charter school, you fund it. You fund it. Don't yeah. ask everybody in the state to fund that school. And that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. And some of these charter schools are nothing but religious schools. And this, we are not teaching reading, writing, and religion in the public schools in this country because there are too many religions to teach. Anyway, let's talk about what you wanted to talk about. No, this, that, <laughs> this is good stuff. It's really good stuff. So the love that I'm talking about is the acronym for learn about people, open your heart to their needs, volunteer to be part of the solution in their lives, and empower others to do the same. And that's four action steps. So it's not a warm, squishy feeling. It's not about religion. It's not about uh, anything other than how can I learn how to treat you better, right? As my friend, as my neighbor, even my enemy, that person I don't get along with. I don't have to pick up a gun to solve an argument with you. I can learn about you. I can find a way to open my heart uh, to you, to to walk a mile in your shoes. And then I can... I can be, you know, big and bold enough to volunteer to be part of the solution. Maybe I should apologize for something. Maybe I should look at things a, a different way. Maybe I should take a deep breath. Whatever it takes for us to find some common ground, and uh, and that's what I, you know, that that's 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 what we do. That's what I do here at Love Is the Answer. It's what my team and I do. So uh, let's get into the four questions that pertain to that love acronym. Um, so the first one I'll ask you, and this is for the learn part, what are some fun facts about you, Jane, that might surprise some people, some likes, dislikes, weird habits, fears, secret superpower, whatever it is that you want to share? Well, I I, I happen to have a super, superpower. Nobody will believe it, but I we bought a little, Christian, a little Baptist church next to our house when we moved in the house we're living in. And 
there are people in there. There are spirits in that building. And the people, and now you're looking at me now like, oh no, she's not one of those. Yes, I am one of those. Where's this going? <laughs> <laughs> because my daughter, when we moved into this house, my daughter would look out the window in her bedroom and here would see people in the house waving at her. And she'd tell me that. And I'd say, well, if you say they were there, they're there. Mom, they're there. I said, Mom, they're there. So when I went over to the house one day after we'd done some work in it or the church. And I, I had had a call from somebody who finds graves for a living. And he told me to take my divining rods over to, to the long story. So I took my divining rods into the church one day because I knew there was somebody there. And I took them uh -huh. over in the corner. And I said, is there someone here? And they crossed. I said, are you male? And they, no. Are you a female? Yes. Can I find out your name? Yes. So I said, is your, does your na first name begin with A? No. B? No. C? Yes. And I found out her name is Catherine Markham. Mm -hmm. And she's in the corner of the church. Now, this, this is absolutely true. So several years after that, we were having a reunion for those of us, those who had ever worshipped in the church. It was 100 years old at that time. Okay. And this older woman was sitting there. And I said, do you remember a woman named Catherine Markham? She said, well, yes, I do. Well, where did she live? What? She lived right down the road. Why do you remember her? Because she used to, when she'd run out of candy at Halloween time, she'd give us dimes. I said, come with me. And I took her over to the corner with my dividing rods. And I said, Catherine, are you here? Yes. I said, do you recognize this woman? Yes. And then, then the two of them had a conversation. This woman would ask the question. I'd ask Catherine. She'd answer it. It was and I have no idea what the answers were, but Catherine answered this woman's questions. It was absolutely remarkable. Mm. So that, that's, I don't have a superpower. I just believe that there's no such thing as death. Okay. So the spirit, no the spirit continues on. Well, your mind is pure energy. Okay. Energy can either be created or destroyed. It was here before you were born, and it will be here after you go on into that other dimension. And I know she's in that other dimension. And if she can be there, I have to behave in such a way that I get to go there too. So that's what's really strange about me. And it's really strange. We have a we have, we have a Confederate soldier buried right next to our garage because mm -hmm. he told her, he talked to Sarah one day and she said, I said, Sarah, if you saw him, he's there. So, yeah. So then somebody who the same man who finds grace for a living came to our house. And did the thing with it. And he said, yes, this is a Confederate soldier. I said, ask him if he wants us to stop parking our cars here because we're parking on his grave sites. And hmm. he said, no, happy where he is. And you leave your cars right where they are. Wow. <laughs> is this a superpower? Oh. No, this is a belief in the hereafter. And yeah. I know what I'm hereafter. Well, to me, that's a superpower. Because you've, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, you've, you've tapped into something special there. Yeah. yeah. We're luck We're very, very fortunate. Wow. Thank you for that answer. Um, and I learned something new about you today. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm weird. And I know I'm weird. <laughs> well, I I'm knew you were weird. I, I've always known that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, we I'm more weird than you realize. <laughs> I, when I said to my pastor friend or someone who graduated from high school with me, John, I don't believe in death. And he looked at me like, I said, John, how can you believe in death? You pray to jesus as far as i know well yeah i do well how can you pray to someone who isn't alive mm. that doesn't make any sense to me but then there are lots of things that don't make sense to me okay second question <laughs> all right all right so open right what's the the open your mind what's the open your heart what's the most challenging thing you've ever experienced and i know you've experienced a lot of challenges how did you deal with uh, it, how did you deal with the most challenging thing you've ever experienced and what have you learned from that experience? Being pilloried by good Christians hmm. because I did the blue-eyed brown eyed exercise with my students, my third grade students, hmm. and told them that we're all members of the same race and you've got no business judging people by the amount of a chemical in their skin. And being absolutely <laughs> a typhoid Mary. When I walked down the street in, in the community in which I had gone from kindergarten, from well, I'd gone to high school, but my parents had lived in that community, and so had my grandparents and my great grandparents. But I became a minus quantity the minute I said, People were all members of the same race, and you got to get over this racism. Okay. That's a, that real, uh, that's been a real challenge, and it's been an exciting challenge, and it's been a 
a rewarding challenge and a renewing challenge. Every time I say that to a group of people who say, you know, I think you're right. You've changed the way I feel about myself and my world. Wow. If you can do that once in your life, you're fortunate. When you can do that with a thousand people in a whatever in Hawaii several years ago and have them all stand and, and applaud after when I, maybe they were applauding because I was leaving, but they were applauding at the end of my remarks. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's really, that's really a remarkable experience. Mm. Wow. So, you know, we have a program, another program under love is the answer. It's called the faith community challenge. And it really like digs into the heart of that. We get, a church that's predominantly black together with a church that's predominantly white. It can be other variations of difference as well, but the the key is to get a group of people together that doesn't look or, you know, doesn't look like the other group. Right. And we've found that it's such an extraordinary experience for most of the people that participate because they just were going along with what society told them to do. Right. And and then when they get into this world of mixing cultures and learning about each other, it's like, wow, their their lives have just uh, advanced to another level. So they I, change they change, they change their attitude. Yeah, they change their behavior. Yeah. But the important thing is they do not change their skin color. Mm. And this is this is what we've got to convince people: there is no black and there is no white. We are all shades of brown. That black and white business came up during the Spanish Inquisition, and before that, it didn't exist. And the word race, meaning a specific group of people, came out of France in 1580. That's what, how short a time this nonsense has been going on. But mm. those people that you call black and white came together, and skin color didn't matter. Yeah. When skin color no longer matters, when it's all right to be whatever you are, but you're just another member of the human, human race who came in shades of brown. We all come in shades of brown. There are no white. There are no black. There are no yellow. There are no red people. There are only shades of brown. I love that. And we ignore that as somebody calling to tell me that they want me to buy something. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll right. stop. So we'll get on to the next one, the volunteer, the third one, which is, and, and this is about how do you exercise social responsibility, how you give back and why. Now, you know, I'm asking Jane Elliott how you give back. You've already given the world incredible, incredible gifts, but what's something that you like to do that maybe people don't know uh, that much about? Oh, well, okay. what I like to do, what I insist on doing now, what I will do without being paid for doing it is educating people about race. Okay. I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the active, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in leading people out of ignorance. And I will do that without being paid to do it when I have to, and I'll take the money when I can get it. But we've got to educate people to the idea that we're all members of the same race. That makes me, that gives me great joy to do that with someone and have enlightenment appear in their eyes. And you can tell when this happened. Yeah, I've experienced it. And uh, you know, yeah. I had the, as you know, I had the great pleasure of, uh, of having my daughter uh, come over to your home and, and uh, she learned from you. And my daughter is a teacher who oh, loves, okay. she, she loves to teach. She loves to educate. She loves little kids and, uh, and she pours her heart and soul into it. And I, I know that her time with you made a, a difference in, in her well, life. When you pour your heart and soul into educating young people or old people, you don't lose a thing. You gain from them an immense amount more than mm. you give to them. Mm. Because they reinforce what you're saying and what you're believing and what you learned from your father at, at his knee when he said, um, <laughs> The things that you just didn't want to hear at the time, but he was right. He was right. He'd say there, you know the difference between right and wrong? Now do the right thing, God damn it. And I'd think he lied. And he'd look at me like, you want to, you want to talk about that now? And he'd, mm, that's okay, Dad, you go ahead. You know, yeah, yeah. He just, he gave us everything we know about being moral human beings. Mm. And the worst memory I have 
is when he lost his favorite daughter at the age of three and a half. Mm. And I don't know how he went on and raised those other six. So he was a fantastic, fantastic model for behavior of not love, but morals, honesty, and believing in a higher power. Okay. Those are those are three qualities that uh, kind of go hand in hand with love. Well, you don't. He never said I love you. He just said you did the right thing by God. Mm. That's a good idea. I'm proud of you. I, I lived many years of my life wanting to hear him say I'm proud of you because if he said he was proud of you, you must have done something very very right. Mm. Wow. Well, Jane, I know a lot of people who are proud of you, and I know. Well, no. Oh no no they are they are shocked at me first and then they are <laughs> she's right well what if she's right then what are we going to do and then they some of them do it yeah yeah so that's not that's that isn't that doesn't make me feel proud that just makes me feel grateful number 1 that they listen yeah number 2 that they learned and number 3 that they were willing to act on what they learned that's huge yeah. That, well, yeah, that's, but that's their choice. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. their choice. And, and in November, we're going to make some more choices. I hope we make the right one. Oh, this <laughs> is a scary year, a yeah. scary, scary year, because right now people are trying to remove real love and replace it with worship. Yeah. Idol, yeah. I, idolatry. Yeah. yeah. Bigotry. Yeah. Bigotry is, you know, this is what we're talking. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Are we done? <laughs> one more. One more. I promise you this will be short and sweet. <laughs> okay. It hasn't been sweet yet, but it's, it's short. <laughs> All right. So here we go. This is the last one. It's the E. It's for Empower. If you knew this was your last day on earth and Lester Holt from NBC News invited you to share one last message with the world to inspire people to be good to yourself and others, as he says, what would you say? You're, you're going to find this totally ridiculous, but I would say, and now about it, these three, faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these is charity, and I would then say, Mr. Holt, remember, we blue-eyed people took that verse out of the Bible and changed charity to love, because charity means you're going to give something. It's going to might cost you some money, so we'll call it, to, we'll cause, turn it to love. And you can say, I love you without it costing you a dime. Mm. So I, I would say, and now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. And if people would start to talk about charity and practice charity, pretty soon we would have a loving community. Amen. We could, yeah, oh. we, a women. Hey, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a women. <laughs> I know that that's not what amen means, but I'm so tired of, particularly now at this time, we are trying to put women back in the kitchen and back in the bedroom. That's what part of this Christian, whatever it is, is talking about, is we're going to put those women back where they belong. Yeah, I'm sorry, they, but they we, wanna, we can't wanna, do that. They want to put fact, us uh, heavily, heavily mel melanated people back uh, to where they think we belong, too. Right, right. But it's going to be worse for the heavily melanated women than for the men. We're going to kill off the men and we're going to use the women, which mm. is what we have always done. So, And this is being done in the name of Christianity. These Christian nationalists are going to do a really bad job on all of us, but they're really going to do a bad job on women of all color groups. So we have to be aware that <laughs> there's three things. There's three things I need to say here. Number one, without what we call blacks, there would never there would not be what we call whites. Mm. Yeah, Jesus a was a woman. Yeah, a woman. Jesus was an <laughs> Ethiopian Jew. He had curly, wig, cur curly, kinky, woolly hair and feet of bronze. So let's get over that one. Mm. Number two, without the Jews, there would be no Christians. Mm. Uh -huh. The true. first four, the first four or five books of the Old Testament came out of the Torah, which is the Brit the Jewish book of faith. And number three, without women, there would be no men. All right now. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then somebody's saying, well, it takes a man to make a baby. No, it doesn't. You can put mm -hmm. two female eggs together into a Petri dish, break down the cell wall, and come up with another female mammal. If you put a bunch of sperm cell, sperm cells in a Petri dish and mix them up, all you get are mixed up sperm. But that's not the same thing with female cells. We could, mm -hmm. and we did probably, reproduce asexually for many years before the mm -hmm. first man was born. So the first man that was born was probably uh, mutation. So uh -oh. when you're, yeah, when you're listening to a mutation, remember that when you're listening to a man, you're listening to a mutant. And some of my best friends are mutants. I was married to a mutant, 59 years. And I still adore him. So oh, mutations are, mutants are a good thing to have around. <laughs> Jane, it is always a pleasure to be around you. Thank you. Well, thank you. We, we didn't have an argument. We didn't have a disagreement. <laughs> you don't want me to say something really ugly and I'm proud <laughs> I love you so much thanks so much for your time you're most welcome call again sometime <laughs> will do have a good day or make it a good, make it a good day for somebody else okay oh I'll definitely try to do that okay definitely. go for it all right <laughs>